president taking something of a victory lap in the wake of the DOJ watchdog scathing report on the Clinton probe. It totally exonerates me. Uh, there was no collusion. There was no obstruction. And if you read the report, you'll see that. The president stays on the attack against what he calls his opponents at the FBI. I think that James Comey was unfair to the people of this country. I think what he did was a disgrace. If we make a mistake, we're going to confront it. House Republicans are trying to put the finishing touches on a plan for immigration reform. I hate the children being taken away. The Democrats have to change their law. That's their law. Confusing children whether they're dreamers or whether they're little children uh, at the border now for a political purpose, to change. We're going to restore the rule of law in our immigration system. Former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort in federal custody as a judge revokes his $10 million bail and orders him to jail. The fact that Paul Manafort went off to jail today when Hillary Clinton continues to walk free. U.S. Open at Shinnecock Hills Golf Club in New York. This is one of the toughest courses in the world. Did you see that? It's, the, it's not just the song, though. There's a little graphic that brings the song. Oh. I don't know if you missed that. I did. I'd have to watch next hour. Watch more closely, Abby. <laughs> You're on the show. Yeah, I was watching. I was Look, looking at the I sunset. I raise my hands. Raise your hands. You can. It was just six weeks, weeks ago. We had a broken wing. Now we're raising these. He's ready to go. Griff Jenkins, Abby Huntsman, yours truly. We are so proud of you. <laughs> so great. No, I was looking at the sunset because that's one of the great things about getting up uh, the middle of the night is we get to watch the sunrise. <laughs> yes. And on beautiful days here in New York City, uh, there's no better sunrise uh, than here. Yeah, so you got to take it in. What yeah. about the beach? <laughs> like on the beach? Hey. Like some of those sunrises, no better. But see, look it's at like, that. It's like over the skyscrapers. It's just it's a beautiful oh, the look. Beach, though, there's it it's international. Nice. Happy International Surfing Day. There's surfers everywhere watching the sunrise. It's International Probably Surfing Day all across the world. People is that a real thing? You made That's that. Right. You, you know, make real. that up. It's real. Today, today. Jim. Wow. I'm glad it's, it's, it's summer. You're here. But I know you you're feel on the couch. It. Yes. Yeah. I'd rather be here than surfing. It is summer, and that is a wonderful thing. And not only can I raise my arms. I can carry 568 pages of <laughs> Let me see an that. inspector I know you read it. I, I read the, uh, the executive summary. But uh, well, guess you what? Griff gets to thing. be our Cliff Notes version <laughs> because this thing is so freaking long and you have digested the whole thing. And we're still reeling in from what happened on Thursday. There are still some big nuggets that have come out of this report that many people cannot wrap their head around. Unbelievable some of the things that have come out of this. That's exactly right. Now, we have the Inspector General Michael Horowitz and the current FBI Director Chris Ray is going to tell testify on Monday and Tuesday before the Senate Judiciary Committee and the House Committee. And there's something we know that Comey was found to be insubordinate. We know that five agents have been referred for administrative action. And we know that Peter Strzok said that we're going to stop them in reference mm -hmm. to Trump's campaign. But what we don't know, and we're going to hear more about, is a missing month. There is a part of this report where an agent in New York working on Anthony Weiner's sex case finds classified documents on Weiner's laptop. Yep. And he notifies Washington headquarters, specifically Peter Strzok, who's heading up the Clinton email thing and says, I got something here. And this is discovered on September 29th. I want to put that date up there. Now, it isn't until October 28th, this is in 2016, that James Comey notifies Congress of the discovery of these emails. And the question is, what was going on for a month that a New York agent was sounding the alarm? In his words to investigators, he heard, quote, crickets for a month and no actions well, were the, taken. The timing is interesting because it is back in 2016. Remember, it was the tail end of, of the election. Right. And so you have to wonder what is going on behind the scenes at the FBI. Why did they wait this long? The only reason we know about it, by the way, is the agent was looking on Anthony Weiner's laptop for other reasons. Right. They were investigating him for his own uh, nefarious issues. And that's how we know about this, unfortunately. Um, but what was going on? Why did this go missing? Why did this sit there for a whole entire month? We don't know. We actually don't know. So you've got Peter Strzok who's in charge of not just the Hillary Clinton investigation. He's in charge of the 
so-called Russia investigation as well. So the same guy in charge of both. Was he sitting on the information for a month because he thought it would benefit Hillary Clinton? Was he so distracted by the you know, case they were building against Trump mm. that he was uh, unable to get to it for a month? I mean, what I'm, what I'm struck by this Horowitz investigation is a lot of good, in interesting nuggets in there that expose bias. But it felt to me just like the Comey press conference. Here's all the bad stuff mm. that they did. Here's all the bias. Here's all the ways Hillary Clinton didn't follow the law. But you know what? We're going to let her off the hook. Right. <laughs> Same thing with Horowitz. Here's Wait. all the bias. All the bias. Everywhere. Here's all the text. We're going to stop him. But you know what? I don't really see well, any evidence of systematic bias. I don't buy it. Anyone with common sense doesn't buy it. Horowitz's report has great information, but comes to the wrong conclusion. Of course, these FBI agents use their personal bias. Well, this bias isn't over yet. To, to, to right. I mean, there, there's agenda. another report coming out, right? The IG 2.0 that's coming yes, but out. But much. also, he'll be on the Hill. Michael Horowitz will be on the Hill, as you mentioned, Monday and Tuesday. So I imagine a lot of those questions will hit on what you're talking about, Pete. And should there be consequences? Very should action be taken against not just people? Peter Strzok, not just Lisa Page, but the other agents that you've talked about that were involved that had uh, pretty terrible things to say about the president, about the president's supporters all throughout this period. Horrible things Correct. to say. Correct. And we heard, we heard, uh, of course, the president saying he wants the investigators investigated. But just to give you some sense mm -hmm. for where members of Congress and the chairman of these committees are on this, is they're drawing this bias, saying maybe it's time to end the Mueller investigation because of this irrefutable bias that Horowitz has laid out is tainting the current Mueller investigation and with the month, the, the possible prioritization of Russia. Here's what Ron DeSantis says about the infection of this bias. It's vindicated Trump in really both prongs of the Mueller investigation. The idea that you're going to have an obstruction of justice investigation because Trump fired the FBI director who the IG acknowledges had no business being an FBI director is a farce. And then the other thing I think it undercuts is the whole genesis of this so-called collusion narrative. They did not give that text message to the Congress when we asked, where Strzok says, we will stop Trump from becoming president. This whole thing is infected with bias and it needs to stop. It's infected and how do you treat the Russia investigation seriously when you know it was launched by people who wanted to let Hillary Clinton off easy? and find a reason to get at Trump. It's, it's the reason why a lot yeah. of people are saying well, the Mueller what, probe that's what Trey Gowdy said on, on Special Report. Trey Gowdy said this whole thing is tainted now, and that's why we had Rudy Giuliani on this show yesterday, and he said this is the reason why we don't want to cooperate moving forward. We're not going to sit down and have that conversation. Why can't really we? How can you take this seriously when you look at the early days of this investigation and the person that was running it at the top, Peter Strzok, and the things that he said about the president? How can you actually take Absolutely. that seriously? Yeah, now, okay. Another media item, though. Did you? So we all know about the concentration camps that were run in World War II. <laughs> Hor horrific treatment of Jews. Yeah. Uh, and then, did you know that the, apparently, according to media figures, America is running concentration camps here? Listen. It's not the law. It is their interpretation of the law. We are... Uh or, or used to be America's greatest democracy. We can't find a solution to this problem without harming children, right. without and, putting and them I, into I, concentration camps. I call this a concentration camp for kids because that's exactly what it's turning out to. When you give kids 22 hours of lockup time and two hours of, of air time, what else can right. it be? And if this is where this country is going, the American people need to wake up and pay attention because your kids could be next. Now, let me just put into a little bit of context the words there of a former RNC Chairman Michael Steele. The policy on the border is a policy that began under Barack Obama, which is separating children from their families. Uh, and now the administration is choosing to apply it with a zero tolerance policy. Uh, under the Obama administration and in 2014, I was down on the border in, uh, in Laredo, Texas, where we had a flow of unaccompanied children coming across. They were allowing uh, nonprofits and whatnot and contacting uh, people in the community to sort of facilitate the separation of children. Now we have a policy for which we're doing it uh, with zero tolerance and finding these facilities for children and their families to be temporarily separated 
until they get so why, to a court date. I just I wonder why the president was attacked yesterday on the North Lawn when he came out impromptu and did that almost an hour of a presser with with Steve Ducey and then and then the press and they were attacking him saying you're a liar you're lying about that it, it wasn't a democratic policy. What is the truth there? I think that is the big confusion is of of. Does it go back to the, the earlier days of the uh, Obama administration or even before that? Uh, are they just implementing those policies or is what is going on now completely so, different? So let's have that conversation about policy, right? Mm -hmm. How do we best disincentivize people from bringing children across the border illegally? And it, part of it is that record. But you can't have that conversation when you're accusing people of running concentration camps. Yeah. How offensive to Jews whose parents, grandparents were literally gassed to death shot to death in shallow graves in the Holocaust. I mean, this is this is one particular place where kids are being taken care of. They wake up at 6.30, they have breakfast at 7, they go to school until 2, clinical work until 3, recreation afterwards, then they have movie nights, special events, soccer, they get three meals and two snacks a day, video games, pool tables, civics classes. I'm sorry, but I, yeah. I, I also Either served, way, hold on, I also served at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, where we, where we took care of uh, terrorists, mm -hmm. and the way we bent over backwards mm -hmm. to treat them, I know, I guarantee you, on the border for these kids who are temporarily separated from their parents. We're doing everything we can to make sure they're comfortable, they feel loved, that they recognize that this is temporary, they'll be brought back together because their parents broke the law. I would just say it's not sustainable. Right well, now, every week you've got hundreds of kids at the border that are being separated. The president's talked about this. He doesn't want them to be separated. We've got to find a way to move forward. We're going to have a debate about this later on in the show. We're going to be talking about it uh, throughout the morning because well, it's an important topic and one that a lot of people are passionate about. It is, and you know, you want to talk about the policy and the rhetoric is over top, we have uh, Ron Vitello, mm -hmm. the deputy commissioner of the uh, Border Patrol. He's going to come on this show, and you're going to hear directly from him. Yeah. He is on the front lines. That is going to be the interview uh, of the morning yeah. to answer a lot of these questions. He's going to help us better understand what really is going on yep. at the border versus Support. all these headlines you're reading. All right, speaking of headlines, I want to bring you some others we are following this morning, starting with a Fox News alert. A second sheriff's deputy dying overnight after being attacked by an inmate. Teresa King and Patrick. Rick Rohrer shot and killed in Kansas City, Kansas. Investigators believe the suspect grabbed one of their guns as they escorted him into court. We heard a shot. We heard, we heard boom. I seen an officer shot in his head and I seen another officer losing his life on the floor. King was a 13-year veteran of the force. Rohrer served seven years. The suspect, Antoine Fielder, also was shot. He has a long criminal history, including murder charges. Also, this former Trump campaign manager, Paul Manafort, walk, uh, waking up behind bars this morning, a judge revoking his $10 million bail, sending him to jail after he was charged with witness tampering. Manafort is awaiting trial for mostly financial charges as a result of the special counsel's Russian investigation. He has pleaded not guilty and heads to court in mid-September. Also, a tough day at the U.S. Open as several big names missed the cut. Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, uh, Jordan Spieth, is it Spieth? It's McIlroy and Spieth. McIlroy and Spieth. Yes. Uh -huh. I, I, it's Spieth no, it's or Spieth? Spieth. Spieth. Yep. All sent packing after round two of the Shinnecock Hills in New York. Only one golfer is under par. Number one ranked Dustin Johnson. Wow, DJ has a four-stroke lead going into today's third round. You can catch the action today, of course, on Fox and FS1. I should have had Pete read that one no, instead I mean, of myself. I, we correct on occasion. <laughs> yes, we do. You, you, you do a nice job. <laughs> All right, President Trump calling out the findings of the Inspector General's report. I would like to talk. But it seems to be very biased. I did nothing wrong. There was mm -hmm. no collusion. There yep. was no obstruction. But Mr. There was President, no anything. I was guest. Our next guest served 24 years as an FBI special agent. He says bias against the Trump team was obvious. Steve Ducey did a nice job yesterday. Plus, Tom Brady taking on the kneeling protests during the national anthem. Hmm. He doesn't talk much. We'll see what he says coming up. Rudy says that you should not talk to Mueller. A lot of people say that. People are afraid of that. And uh, I would like to talk, but it seems to be very biased. I did nothing wrong. There was mm -hmm. no collusion. There yep. was no obstruction. But Mr. There was President, no one I was... 
That was President Trump on Fox and Friends yesterday, responding to calls for an end to the Mueller investigation as the bombshell IG report revealed significant bias inside the FBI. Chris Swecker, who served 24 years as an FBI special agent, is here to react. Chris, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. What do, what do you make of this? Well, this report is a bit of a bombshell, but it doesn't have a lot of surprises in there for me, except there are some very interesting details that were fleshed out during the 500-plus during the page report. Yeah, you know, clearly there was there was bias on the from the top of the house through the investigative team, and that bias he the inspector general did outline some actions that were taken. That so that's why it's surprising, and as you say, it's a lot like the uh, the infamous Comey press conference where he excoriated Hillary Clinton and then exonerated her, and that's basically what the IG did in this case. He said, yeah, they had bias. And then they did this and this and this. They delayed the, the investigation when the New York, uh, when the Wiener laptop information was developed. They sat on that. They leaked information. They changed language in, in Director Comey's report or his uh, statement to take out incriminating language. That's action. And then at the top of that pyramid was someone uh, running the investigation was someone who took over mm -hmm. $500,000 from the DNC. So Chris, explain this to me. As someone who's been on the inside, who's been a part of these investigations, how can you draw the conclusion that we see all these text messages, and here's one, we'll, it's infamous at this point, but we'll, we'll put it up again. Uh, Lisa Page saying, Trump's not ever going to become president, right? And Peter Strzok, who's leading the investigation into the Hillary Clinton email server and eventually the Russia investigation, no, no, he won't. We will stop it. How does an inspector general who seems to be, it, it, you know, diving into the details, willing to say, no, no, we don't see any bias here. There were some tough decisions made, but ultimately this was largely above board. How, how do you make sense of that? Yeah, he had to contort himself into a pretzel not to come up to a come to a decision or a conclusion that there was that the bias reflected was reflected in the investigation. I think he played it safe. I think he lost his nerve. Hmm. And I mean, clearly, action was taken. They changed language. They took gross negligence out of the director's statement. By the way, the director was preparing this statement two months before the conclusion of the investor of the press conference. So yep. he, he was clearly communicating to these investigators, hey, this is there's going to be no violation here. We're going to exonerate her before a lot of key interviews took place, before a lot of mm -hmm. uh, key things happened during the investigation. So here's the guy at the top of the you know the house there saying, look, there's going to be no, there, this is going to be no harm, no foul, and they're changing language, and Chris, then they sit on some explosive information for a month. Chris, quickly, because we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you, uh, Horowitz and Director Ray, current FBI director, will testify on Monday and Tuesday before Senate and House committees. What would be the question you would ask them? I would outline all those actions and say, if this were not. You know, this were not the FBI. If this were just the average citizen out there, what conclusion would you have really come to? And how can you ignore all these different actions and then come to a different con the conclusion that they did? And I'd also there are a lot of things that weren't covered. Why wasn't uh, Jim Comey's uh, leaks covered during this this IG report? They covered all the other leaks. There were at least 300 contacts with reporters. So clearly there was a culture of leaking mm -hmm. under Comey and Comey's inner circle. Why did they ignore that? Interesting. And we know yeah. Comey had a Gmail account as well. A bit sure of did. irony there investigating. Chris, uh, Chris Wecker, 24 years of service in the FBI. Thank you for your service. Uh, it's got to be frustrating to watch an agency like this be tainted it's by bias. Chris, thank you. Chris. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Well, immigration set to take center stage next week with two Republican bills up for a vote. But will it offer amnesty? And how will that sit with the president's base? David Webb, I saw him in the green room, and he is on deck. Plus, does Tom Brady side with the NFL kneelers or the president? His answer, which you can't wait for, is coming up.
Welcome back. Some quick headlines. China retaliating against U.S. tariffs taxing $34 billion worth of American goods. The targets are things like soybeans, hybrid and electric vehicles, seafood and pork. The taxes go into effect on July 6th. That's the same day the U.S. will hit China with $50 billion in import tariffs over what the president calls unfair trade practices. And the United States could withdraw from the Human Rights UN Human Rights Council at any time. According to Reuters, the Trump administration is expected to quit the forum over its treatment of Israel. The U.S. boycotted the council for three years under President George W. Bush. Abby? Thank you, Griff. All right, rhetoric surrounding the immigration debate now reaching fever pitch levels. The Democrats have decided to politicize the issue rather than get serious about addressing the president's four well, pillars. Ask- I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country, and maybe there will be. We are scarring those children for life by taking them away and institutionalizing them. This is un-American. That's what this is. This is un-American. Let's just- the Democrats, by the way, are very weak on immigration. This has two Republican bills head for a vote next week. One from House Speaker Paul Ryan that could give legal visas to 1.8 million young people here illegally. The other from Congressman Bob Goodlatte that mandates e-verify and would protect 700,000 illegal young people. Both bills would fund the border wall. Here to discuss Fox News contributor David Webb. David, good to have you with us Morning. as always. And it was supposed to be a debate, I'll make it clear. Unfortunately, our Democratic guest was not able to make it this morning. So we will chat about this uh, <laughs> together. So that's happening this this week on the Hill, but you heard the back and forth there that we just played. The country could not be more divided when it comes to immigration. That's why this is so tough to get something passed, to get it right. What do you think is going to happen? Can the president, can he impact this at all? Do you think he needs to get ahead of this? Does he need to negotiate as he often talks about on the campaign trail that he can be the one to get things done on the Hill? Yeah, I think he really needs to get, a ho- get out ahead of this and focus on the message from the campaign. And by the way, the country is not really very divided on the issue they want a solution it's the politicians like Luis Gutierrez who makes outrageous statements like Jeff Sessions wants blacks back in the back of the bus and other Americans you know when that happens or Nancy Pelosi you're not going to get there but the president needs to step out on the principles and a comprehensive border barrier visa reform immigration reform structure that actually works you know when you have differences in bills between things like e-verify mandating that you have e-verify so the employers are held accountable you need that. Uh, a border barrier system, wall, technology, uh, interdiction, detection and interdiction, also immigration judges as well, and a better fast track system to return illegal aliens. This all has to be part of a package and it has to work together. And the problem with the Ryan bill is essentially it's incremental failure. In Washington, you do a little piece, a little piece. You never put together a true comprehensive approach to the solution and you never effectively solve it. The problem is, as you know, it's a negotiation. So if you put that forward, the Goodlatte bill gets enough votes, then it goes to the Senate. We both know that that is where things go to die, Senate. right? Yeah. So you look at the bigger picture, and if you really want to get something through both the House and the Senate, do you need to work in moderates? Do you need to work in some Democrats? Well, is that the way to move you forward? You need to work in good policies. And I know oftentimes the debate is over moderate versus conservative versus Democrat or whatever the case may be. The fact is that when you look at this from a law law enforcement, a structural and process. It needs to include elements that work together. That's why I brought up those points. The, the argument over moderate versus conservative needs to go to what works. And I would, I would frankly, if I could say to the president, unless this bill has a process that works, mm-hmm. you need to say no to the bill. Republicans have got to stop snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. And the Democrats are never going to agree with them because it's not about agreement. It's about the wedge issue. Yeah, That's and an that, important that is component. why this is so complicated, because that is your take. You also have Paul Ryan saying something different, Democrats saying something completely different. The other part of this conversation, David, uh, are these children. And you have hundreds of, of children a week over the past six weeks that have been separated from their children. They're not in cages. They're not being gassed. You see these headlines. And they're horrific. The reality is something different. Uh, But where does this end? Because even the president has said no one wants children to be separated from their parents. No one wants this to happen. Can you do a DACA bill that's separate from all of this? Look, uh, American citizens who commit crimes, uh, 
in certain circumstances, their children are separated from them during incarceration. So let's not pretend that we're only separating children. We're separating children from criminals. Uh, there are also cases where we're not sure if they're their children. Also, when the children are separated, they go to typically other blended or illegal alien families who then disappear. So the Democrats have completely miscast this issue. But the policy is not sustainable. The way it is right now, you could say, okay, well, let's put them in places where they can stay for the time being. But that, that can't last. We can't no, say it, it's a country well, it can't that we're last okay with because that. it's not practical. But the, the other elements I brought into this, how we deal with the illegal alien who has committed the crime in whatever manner. Uh, to solve the children's issue, you've got to solve that issue. You've got to lower the numbers that are in there so you can have a manageable problem. And when it comes to the children reuniting them, it may be that while you're being yeah. deported, you're reunited. Uh, we, we've got to stop with just the what's my versus yours and look at what is possible, what is practical, and what is effective. Yeah, and how can we do it together? All right, well, a lot on the president's plate. We'll see what happens on the Hill next Just week. Get out ahead of yeah. it. Stay on top I of agree. it. Be fair and structural. It will get done. All right, David, good to see you this morning. Good to see you. All right, coming up on the show, recruiting for ISIS straight from her home in Wisconsin. A mother of seven, you can see her right there. Just busted. Details on that ahead. And an FBI employee says President Trump supporters are all poor, uneducated, and lazy. Dan Bongino is here. He is fired up. He is next. Mr. President, when did you first learn that Hillary Clinton used an email system outside the U.S. government for uh, official business while she was Secretary of State? Uh, at the same time, uh, everybody else learned it through news reports. Were you disappointed? The policy of my administration is to encourage transparency. Uh, and that's why my emails, the Blackberry that I carry around, uh, all those records are uh, available and, and archived, and I'm glad that uh, Hillary is uh, instructed that uh, those emails uh, that had to do with official business need to be disclosed. So that was former President Obama in March of 2015 being asked about what he knew about Hillary Clinton's private server. Let's bring in Dan Bongino, former NYPD officer, former Secret Service agent, host of the Dan Bongino Show. Dan, good morning. So from part of what we learned from Michael Horowitz's report is that, of course, President Obama was emailing one of a few people who had the private email address of Hillary Clinton, emailing back and forth off of the official server, yet he claims he didn't know she had a private email. Pete, that's nonsense. And, and you know, now do you, you sense the frustration of large swaths of America who feel like, you know, there's two justice systems out there, you know, one for the elites and one for the rest of us who have to live under this. People are upset because Obama's clearly not telling the truth here, Pete. Let me let me debunk this thing for you immediately. Barack Obama's Blackberry, his personal Blackberry, the emails that came into it had to be vetted in advance. They had to be whitelisted, the opposite of being blacklisted, mm. right? Somebody on the White House staff had to give Hillary Clinton's private email to that to WACA, the White House Communications Agency that handles that, the security of that device. They had to know he was not telling the truth. It's I mean, it's unbelievable what this administration got away with. And by the way, one more thing that provides a perfect incentive for Barack Obama's Department of Justice to make the Hillary Clinton email investigation go away like an Alka-Seltzer tablet in water because Barack Obama would have been a witness. All right, Dan, you're a mm. Trump supporter. You've been very clear about that on the show. So there is an yeah. FBI employee, a lawyer within the FBI, and there was a message that was in this report who calls them um, uneducated, lazy, uh, poor, uh, are all poor to middle class. I'm going to read this to you, actually, the exact word. He says, Trump supporters are all poor to middle class, uneducated, lazy. Uh, POS. POS. You can take what you want from that, huh. that think he will magically grant them jobs for doing nothing. They probably didn't watch the debates, aren't fully educated on his policies, and are stupidly wrapped up in his emerited enthusiasm. Dan, they're speaking to you directly there. Uh, jobs for doing nothing. Um, <laughs> that's interesting from a, you know, a, a government employee. And I, believe me, I'm not impugning the men of the FBI and the women or the federal agents. I was one. I worked as a Secret Service agent. But that's a fascinating take from people who work for a government that really doesn't care about quality uh, of, of the, you know, anymore. I mean, it, it's, guys, you know, I, this, when, I, when I got this this morning, when the producer sent it over to me, the first thing that came to mind to me is, you know, my mother-in-law, right? She's an immigrant to this country. You know, she cleaned planes at, at, at LaGuardia Airport and used to have to feed her kids the airplane peanuts that were left over. 
You know, she's a Trump supporter. I dare you, 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 you government employees in the D.C. bubble to look her in the face and tell her how uneducated and what a POS she was. You, now she lives a relatively prosperous life down here in Florida because for 30 years she busted her butt. Her ankles don't work. She has arthritis in her wrists. She's a mess from working her butt off her whole life while you goons in D.C. targeted this guy, collected a government employee and can never be fired from your cushy jobs. This is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. And I, I get it. I, I know a million people have a theory on why Trump was elected. I'll tell you, you can attribute texts and thoughts like that to re Absolutely. reason number one in that exhibit. Dan, h briefly, how does Michael Horowitz end up concluding that bias didn't involve, that these decisions were not involved by bias? You, you know, Pete, interestingly enough, um, he didn't. I, the executive summary, he makes no direct connection. Yep. But if you actually read through on some of the pages in the report, he actually does make a connection between political bias. Uh, he just, in, in the executive summary, it's kind of loose. And I guess what he's saying is there's no paper trail of sure. political bias. But if you read the report, it's 500 pages mm. of political bias. Well, so, Dan, we did, and we found a missing month that uh, Peter Strzok <laughs> did not act perhaps on an agent in New York, the rank and file, doing their job, selling the alarm for a month about what he found on Anthony Weiner's laptop, looking into a sex case that was pertinent to Hillary's email server. Dan, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dan. We'll see what we find out on Monday and Tuesday when Horowitz takes yeah. to the Hill. Yeah. Appreciate it. You got it. Good to see you, Dan. All right, some other headlines I want to bring you this morning. On a sad note, a mother of seven accused of trying to recruit, this is a horrible story, trying to recruit for ISIS will remain behind bars. Seen right there. Wahiba Issa dies, denied bond in Wisconsin. She's accused of hacking social media accounts to spread propaganda and share instructions on how to build bombs. Lawyers claim that she was just lonely and didn't pose a threat. Deus, who is originally from Israel, faces up to 20 years in prison. And the neighbor who attacked Senator Rand Paul, leaving him with broken ribs, will now spend a month in prison. Uh, Rene Boucher was convicted of assault after tackling the Kentucky lawmaker in his yard last year. You remember that in a fight over lawn debris. A judge ordering Boucher to one year of supervised release, a $10,000 fine and 100 hours of community service. Paul says Boucher should have gotten more jail time. Also remember this, this woman who uh, spit on a pro-police demonstrator. Well, that woman is now expected to turn herself into a Chicago police station later today after the man pressed charges. Fox News cameras capturing that incident at a demonstration in Chicago City Hall last month. Police were protesting Mayor Rahm Emanuel accusing him of being anti-law enforcement. And Tom Brady throws his support behind NFL national anthem protesters. The New England Patriots quarterback discussing the issue with Oprah. There were a lot of really good, healthy conversations coming out of it. You, you respect what other people, you know, I do. I, I respect why people are doing what they're doing. And they're doing it for different reasons. They can do things for their reason, and you have respect for that. But I thought it was were great. There, Brady never kneeled for the anthem. His comments come ahead of a new NFL rules requiring players on the field to stand. Hmm. All right. The debate continues for sure. Rick. Tell us about the. Oh, world. you're over there, David. <laughs> there it's right there. there. You were why I yelled his name really loud. You were focused in on the headlines. Rick, how beautiful was the sunrise this morning? Did you see uh, it? You know what? Why? Nope. Come on. You didn't see it. No, I didn't see it. Am I the only one that likes the sunrises here in New York? I love the sunrises, but I don't like it if I'm up to see the sunrises. Sure, yeah, you want to be sleeping. I would rather be. I love the sunrises. You and the rest of America. Well, it's a beautiful are, day today. Amazing. It, actually, the weather has been great the last couple of days. Uh, take a look at this. Down across much of the eastern part of the country, things not looking that bad. Uh, get ready across parts of the southern uh, play, or southern Gulf states here. We are going to see some heavy rain move in uh, more by tomorrow. But take a look at this. Some big storms moving through Madison with Wisconsin overnight, causing some localized flooding, also moving through the Chicago area, clearing out just a little bit behind that and down across parts of the four corners. We have not seen any kind of rain across much of Arizona. Uh, Tucson, 106 days last night, got their first 0.01 uh, inch of rain. So you take a look at that. That's some moisture that's coming in. That was what was Hurricane Bud in across parts of the Pacific. That moisture moving in across the four corners. Good news because they have the fires across Cal uh, much of California. 
Colorado, I should say, and that's going to help things. The other story, guys, we're going to watch is major heat across parts of the plains this weekend, uh, feeling like over about 105 up across parts of Minnesota. So, Oof, read really? is on. Yep. Minnesota's part of the plains? It is. Is it? Yeah. I guess. It feels Great like plains. North. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll give it to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All <right. laughs> thanks, Rick. All right, thanks, Thank Rick. you, Rick. Coming yes, up. I'm getting it slowly but surely. <laughs> Coming up. As Europe and other major economies lose steam, the U.S. is booming, leaving other economies in the dust. We're breaking it down. And some of the on the left and even the right teaming up to slam President Trump's supporters as being cult-like. But are they only doing damage to themselves? Tammy Bruce, up next. Listen. It's becoming a cultish thing, isn't it? Now, if it seems to you like the GOP is cultishly loyal to Trump, you're not alone. Republican Senator Bob Corker claiming that fellow Republicans are, quote, cultish when it comes to supporting President Trump. We're in a strange place. I mean, it's almost, uh, uh, you know, been a, it's becoming a cultish thing, isn't it? It's not a good place for any party to, to end up with a cult-like situation as it relates to, uh, to, to a president that uh, happens to be of, purportedly of the, of the same party. And a Washington Post headline also doubling down on the cultish language reading, quote, Republicans embrace the cult of Trump, ignoring warning signs. Oh, little Bob Corker. Here to react, radio talk show host and Fox News contributor Tammy Bruce. Tammy, you know. Good morning. Help us out here. So you've got a, pres a Republican president achieving things that most Republicans would dream of having through deregulating, cutting taxes, mm -hmm. cutting deals to make the world a safer place. Why is that considered a cult with this president? Well, it's interesting because those remarks then are a reflection of his supporters, not of the president. Mm. All right, so they, they still, and this mm. is, I think, what's clear, regardless of what party you're on, obviously Republican or Democrat, it's the opposition. And what they reveal with this comment is they don't understand how American, the American people are in, uh, interested in the issues interested in policy, recognizing that, that we are, you know, we ha that government has an impact on our lives. So that our response, in fact, is we're partisans. I support the president, uh, but we're partisans for the United States and for our families. So we watch the future drain out over the last eight to 10 years, arguably 12 years. And we, we were told that was the new normal, that there was nothing else that could be done, that you were going to always work three part-time jobs and have no money. The president be made promises. Uh, we waited to see. He delivered. And that deserves support. But what's interesting is when you've got someone like Bob Corker or the legacy media deciding to then label the support for this president based on his success mm. as a cult, you're dismissing the issues. You're revealing that you don't understand yourself the value of the issues and how the American people make decisions. Mm. Donald Trump, we, it's not about support for Donald Trump. He is the, the result of our wanting something better. Yeah. He is the one who mm. defined it and said, I understand, and then had a but path to deliver. Timmy, why, though, uh, Corker's from Tennessee, as yes. I am. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of Trump supporters there. Yeah. Why, why would he offend them? Why would he say this? Oh, yeah, Tennessee saved us from Al Gore, you'll, you'll recall. So <laughs> I have a, a, a big affinity for Tennessee. Um, the reason is, is because there is, a, I think, a, a, a commitment more to the establishment more to what they believed was important, uh, the, the sense that the, the government itself as an entity is the thing that matters, had became the life force for the country, that they lot, literally lost touch with the individual American and the nature of what makes this country great, which is not the government, it's the nature of the citizen. So this was a sh an existential shock. They believed that things were a certain way. They also believe that the government is necessary because you've, we've seen some of the comments as you've been reporting, even in the IG's report, the attitude about FBI agents, mm -hmm. of, of general opposition of Trump, it, talking about the, the tr average Trump voter in yeah. such derogatory ways, this is the way that they view the average American, those who are not living in Malibu or Manhattan. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. We have to address it. The fact is, those in, they're wrong, but they've, that this government has so lost touch with what their job is and what they're doing here, and the fact that their job is policy, mm. not to reign over uh, the yeah. the American people. Good well, point. There. Yeah. So this it's Thanks. it's a wake up call, I think, across the board, and and uh, it, it tells us more about them. All right, Timmy Bruce, thank you. Remember in November.
Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The headline says it all. The economic growth in the U.S. leaves behind, leaves the world behind. We'll break down the latest booming economy news. Welcome back. Well, the economy is booming, and the Wall Street Journal says it all. It says economic growth in the U.S. leaves the world behind. Here to break it all down, financial analyst Heather Zumaraga. Heather, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, in addition to that headline, we've got another one from the New York Times. It says this, new milestones in jobs report signal a bustling economy. Heather, if the New York Times is saying that, it's pretty tough to refute. <laughs> and you know it. You know it must be. That's right, Pete. Uh, European growth is also on the European uh, growth is on the decline. China is also on the decline. Yet the U.S. Uh, is on pace for the fastest growth in the past four years. So for the past three months ending in June, GDP is above 4%, Pete. And that's that's a stellar number. That That's uh, we're doing very well. Absolutely, Heather. So the Obama folks would say, well, you're welcome. That was uh, to our credit. Uh, yeah. Who do you, do you point to the Trump administration's policies on that? You can, uh, to be honest or fair and balanced, I think you can point to both. Uh, the fact is that growth is picking up even more under President Trump. If you look at unemployment, it's down even more since President Trump was elected uh, over a year and a half ago. Unemployment claims fell to their uh, near historic levels this past week. 1.7 million people are mm -hmm. receiving benefits. And all that, that, although that sounds like a lot, it's actually the lowest levels since Richard Nixon in 1973. Yeah. Well, the Washington Examiner had this headline, fewer people on unemployment benefits than any time in 44 years. That is n nothing but good news. Yes, you're right. I mean, that's what matters to everyday Americans. If you have a job, are you making money? Can you pay your bills? This is a very robust labor market by any measure. Unemployment rate down at 3.8 percent is going to mean that wages are going to increase soon and consumer spending is off the charts, Pete. So good things across the board. Absolutely. Heather Zumaraga, short and sweet. Thank you for your insight you on these headlines. Yes, Appreciate it. All right. Well, straight ahead, Alan Dershowitz, Herman Cain, and Stuart Varney, all here live on this Saturday edition of Fox & Friends, coming up. Dance,